Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is the Threat and Imposition of Economic Sanctions Database. We've talked previously about how it is difficult to infer the effectiveness of sanctions based purely off of situations where sanctions were imposed. And scholars have recognized this for quite some time. And this led to the development of TIES, or the Threat and Imposition of Economic Sanctions Database. TIES is the acronym. It's a lot shorter and a lot less of a mouthful. So that's why we call it TIES. The scholars who developed TIES got the funding precisely to address the selection problem that we've discussed previously. That's why TIES, the T in TIES, stands for threat. So we're not just looking at situations where the economic sanctions were imposed, we're also looking at situations where they were threatened. And by going back a step, essentially back a step on the game tree that we've been looking at previously, we can get a better feeling for when sanctions are effective, even when they're not actually imposed. And this TIES data set covers 1,412 cases from 1945 to 2005. 1945 being the start of the post-Cold War, or rather the post-World War II era, and 2005 being the last day we have data for. Now, I've played around a little bit with TIES in previous lectures, so part of this graphic might look a little familiar to you. You've seen this blue line before. This is the number of sanctions incidences over a period from 1945 to 2005. The blue line represents all cases where sanctions are imposed or they are threatened. So these are the universe or the domain of cases where sanctions were somehow important to international affairs. The red line is a subset of those cases. Those are the situations where just sanctions were imposed. So it's not just a threat. You have to go all the way up to sanctions being imposed to register on that red line. And this takeaway from the graph here is that not all threats actually go to imposition. About half of the cases are situations where the sanctions are threatened, but then they never actually get imposed. And if we look at a breakdown here of outcomes by the timing of the outcome, whether it was during a sanction stage or during a threat stage, we've seen the data on the sanction stage before. Again, that's about half of the situations, that second row there. That first row is new to us. This is the outcomes during the threat stage. And the key takeaway point here is that if we look at the first column, that's the column where the target acquiesces, the target gives up whatever the situation is or whatever the issue at stake is to the sender after the sender makes the threat to impose sanctions. So what that's saying here is that 20% of the time when we have a sanction being threatened, the target backs down without any sanctions actually being imposed. Which means that if we only look at the cases where sanctions are actually imposed, we're not getting a full overview of the effectiveness of sanctions. That's precisely the theoretical argument that I made in the last lecture, and now we actually see it borne out in the data. There are a lot of other things to talk about here, but I'm going to leave it there. You can pause the video and look more at this crosstab if you'd like to and spend a little uh, more time figuring out what's going on and where the outcomes are going when you have sanctions being threatened or imposed. On to the next issue, though. Another lie that your cable news channel might tell you. You might hear on cable news that economic sanctions never, ever, 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 ever end. And again, when you hear these sorts of situations or hear these sorts of claims, they usually fall back on the North Korea, Iraq, and Cuba cases. And in fact, those situations or those cases were very, very lengthy. North Korea and Cuba have been going on for decades, and Iraq lasted from the end of the Iran-Iraq war all the way until Saddam was thrown out of power. So those sanctions incidences actually did last quite a long time. But as we will see in this graph, those three cases are not at all of the norm. This is a histogram of the distribution of times of economic sanctions. So we have a duration of economic sanctions in years on the x-axis, and the y-axis is the frequency of those duration times. And what we see here is that a majority of these cases, again, a majority of these cases are sanctions episodes that last less than a year. The situations like North Korea, Iraq, and Cuba that last decades, well, those are the situations that are to the right of the 20-year marker on the x-axis, and you can barely even see any cases that look like that. 
These situations in North Korea, Iraq, and Cuba are extreme. They almost never happen. Your average sanctions episode lasts less than a year. Sanctions, as it turns out, don't last forever. They actually make progress, and they can often do it in a very short amount of time. Last point about cable news lying to you. This is another lie by omission. You might think by watching the news that sanctions are only about military affairs. We're seeing that with Iran right now. We saw it previously with Iraq. We're also seeing it with Russia and Ukraine currently as well. And these are all situations that somehow involve military affairs. As it turns out, if we go to the data and ties, we will see that this is not true. Sanctions, as it turns out, not mostly about military affairs. In fact, military affairs, security affairs, as I have it labeled in the top row, only account for about a quarter of all sanctions episodes. The majority of sanctions situations involve economic crises, essentially trade issues. So that is your average sanctions episode. It's about trade issues. It's not even about security issues. And again, there's a lot of stuff you can see in these cross tabs here, but I just wanted to point out the fact that economic issues definitely outweigh the frequency of security issues in economic sanctions. It's another lie that you hear on your cable news network. So that wraps up this lecture on the TIES database. It's an excellent database. I've used it in my own research, and I love it. I'm so glad it was created, and I'm so glad that I did not have to spend the time creating it myself. That wraps up our discussion of the various sort of data issues in economic sanctions. In the next couple of lectures, we're going to be looking at why we have states imposing sanctions despite the fact that there's this inefficiency puzzle, despite the fact that they cost something to the states. And it would behoove both of the states to figure out ways to resolve their issues without having to impose economic sanctions. So I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.